So this is the, the go over for test one for Physics 1500 this summer. Um, <clears throat> the first thing you're going to want to know is what's my grade? Well, to find your grade, uh, on the front page of your test, this is my answer key, I've, uh, I've got a box. I, I put it wherever it would fit. Sometimes it's up high, sometimes down low, sometimes it's on the other side, but whatever. Add up those points. Those are the points you got for each of the seven problems. And just add them up. That's your score. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, way to find your score. There were 138 points possible. And um, so I just let you add them up. So it'll make it a little bit easier to figure it out. Uh, <clears throat> the other piece of this puzzle that you're going to be wondering about is, is there any way, is there any hope for me? Is, how, how can I, can I succeed in this class still? Uh, and some of you did fine and, and you're not thinking that and some of you aren't doing so fine and you are thinking that. So let me just help those who uh, are wondering that. Uh, what I'm going to do this semester is I'm going to let your final exam count as the final exam and as your lowest test grade. So if this is your lowest test grade, um, it could be replaced with your final exam if your final exam is better. So uh, is there a hope for you? Yeah, you can pull that up. And, and what I've found is that um, people tend to learn physics after you're done with those chapters. So what I'm saying is this test covered chapters one through four, and right now you should be working on chapters five through eight. And usually about chapter six, chapters one through four make a whole lot of sense. So what I'm saying is, is that by the time the semester's done and you've gone through all the chapters and you've had time to sit back and go through them all and you get ready for the final, um, hopefully these first four chapters will make a lot of sense and the final exam can replace this grade. So uh, with that said, I'm going to go through the problem one at a time. So the first problem, <coughs> you've got a car and uh, the driver is driving straight south and um, she drives at 11 meters per second and the time is 1 minute and 20 seconds which is 80 seconds okay notice I'm just gonna pause for a second that's 1 minute and 20 seconds okay that does not mean 1.2 just throwing that out minutes and seconds don't work that way there are 60 seconds in a minute, so one minute is 60 seconds and 20 seconds. That and does mean addition, so it's 60 seconds plus 20 seconds. That's 80 seconds total. So uh, <clears throat> she then makes a hard uh, turn to the west. So now she's going this way. And Right after the 90 degree turn, she hits the gas uh, and accelerates at one meter per second squared for 15 seconds. Okay, and then there's three questions that go with this. So, uh, first question is what's the total distance that she traveled? Second question is what's the total displacement of her car and the third question is what's her final velocity okay so to do this we have to first find the distance for each piece so for this distance uh, she drove this at a constant speed meaning there's no acceleration so uh, we just use the good old-fashioned equation number one off the equation sheet I think most everybody got this part right this is the easiest part of the whole thing uh, you use velocity is distance over time and uh, solve this for displacement or for, for distance up there. And so uh, the distance that she drove is her speed times her time, <coughs> 11 times 80. So delta x1 <coughs> is 880 meters. 
You can do it in your head. It's easy. Now, uh, that means that she started at 11 meters per second and she ended at 11 meters per second. And then she took this turn and the, the instructions say she was a really good driver and she just made this hard 90. She didn't slow down or speed up at all. That corner took no space at all. It was an amazing vehicle. And she just turned around that corner. So now here, at the start of this next leg, she starts at 11 meters per second and then accelerates from there starting at, so she accelerates at one meter per second for 15 seconds, but her initial speed is 11. So, <clears throat> the, the, now we have to figure out distance for this leg. Now, because there is acceleration, you cannot use equation number one for this leg. So, uh, looking at the Fantastic Four, equation number three is the easiest one. Uh, delta x is equal to v naught times t, plus one half AT squared. And so uh, <coughs> the uh, distance, or the, the initial speed is 11, the time is 15, the acceleration is one, and the time is 15, and it's squared. And so when you punch this out, delta X number two is another, um, where are we at here, 277.5. Okay, so the distance from here to here is 880, and the distance from here to here is 277. And, um, and then as long as we're at this, let's find the final speed. She started at 11 here, but she got faster the whole time. That's what acceleration means. Acceleration means you're getting faster and faster. So what was her final speed? Uh, I w you can use a couple different versions to get there. I think the easiest way to get there is equation number two. So let me write that out here. Equation number two says acceleration is change in velocity over time. And that change in velocity means final minus initial. <coughs> and we need to find this solve this for v final. So I'm going to multiply the t up here so that I have acceleration times time is equal to v final minus v initial. Now I'll add that v initial over here so that v final is v initial plus acceleration times time. And so we'll just plug in these numbers here. This will be 11, that's the v initial plus the acceleration, which was 1, times the time, which was 15, and that adds up to 26 meters per second. Okay, so now that we've done that, all this work with this side here and this side here, now we can answer the three questions. Question number one is, what's the total distance? Now that doesn't, that just simply refers to like the odometer on her car, so it counted the wheels turning. That's the distance from here to here plus the distance from here to here. So for part A, we just did 880 plus 277, and that adds up to uh, 1157.5 meters. So that's the answer. Sorry. This is part A and the distance. So here's the answer to part A. Part B asks, what's the displacement? And that's a much harder question because displacement is a vector. And so what displacement is asking is, what's the the straight line distance from here to here, from where she started to where she ended, and not only how far is that, but which way is it, because it's a vector. And remember, vectors always have two parts, the how much and the which way. And so we need to know this vector here. So this is delta x with an underline under it or an arrow over it, whichever way you want to write it. Either way is fine. I write it this way, but this way is just as good. <coughs> and so we need this displacement over here. And so we need to find out how long is it. 
and then which way? So let's do the how long first. Well, that's easy. This is a right triangle, right? So we just do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so <clears throat> to get that answer, we're going to do um, 880 squared plus 277.5 squared square root. And that's the how much. Um, and that answer is 922. 0.7 meters. Okay, so that's how much, but we don't know which way yet, so we got to find an angle somewhere. It doesn't matter which angle where. Um, in general, we draw, uh, let me use a different color here. In general, we draw a coordinate system, and the coordinate system says, there's your x and there's your y, and the angle we want, the standard answer we're looking for, is from positive x counterclockwise all around. That's the angle we want, okay? So we want, so here's positive x going straight up, that's y, and we're looking counterclockwise from positive x, that's the angle we're looking for, that's the standard answer. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find this angle here because that's this angle here. Okay, so if I find this angle here, then I'll know this angle here. And you see how those are alternate interior angles. Remember from back in the day, alternate interior angles. This angle down here is the same as this angle up here. You can see that that matches up there. Okay, so I'm going to start by finding this. And so if that's the angle that I'm looking for, then <clears throat> I can look at this triangle and I can, I know all three sides now, but let's use this one and this one. It doesn't really matter which two I use, but I'll choose this one and this one. So that angle there, the tangent of theta is opposite, which is 880 over the adjacent, which is 277.5. And so that angle, when you figure that out, <clears throat> Uh, theta is going to be 72.49 degrees. Now, the best way to report this is to give the whole angle from positive x axis, and so when we write that out, our final answer is going to be <clears throat> what is the displacement? The displacement is 922.7 meters at uh, 252.5 degrees. Now you say, well, where'd you get 250, 252? I thought it was 72. Well, look, 72 is just this little piece right here. The 70, this is 72.5 from here to here. Well, how far is it from here to here? Well, that's 180. So 180 plus 72, that's your 252, okay? So, uh, or you don't have to write it that way. There's other ways to write it. You could have said um, at 72.5 degrees uh, south of west. See, because here's west. There south, so if you're heading west and you go south 72 degrees, that would be right there. Okay, that works. There, you could do it um, <clears throat> 17.5 degrees west of south. Because south is down here and 17 and a half degrees west of that would be this angle. So there's a handful of ways you can write this. Um, I just showed you three of them. There's another way, but I don't think anybody did it, so I'm not going to tell, tell you about it. But uh, there you go. Oh, let me show you where I put the points. Okay, this problem is worth 16 points. Um, <clears throat> I gave you one point for this answer and two points for knowing that method. I gave you... Uh, in finding the final velocity, I gave you two points for this equation, uh, two points for that equation, and one point for the answer. In finding this distance here, I gave you 
two points for the equation and one point for the answer. For finding part A, I gave you two points if you knew how to add them. For part B, I gave you two points for knowing that you have to add them with uh, Pythagorean theorem. I gave you two points for knowing how to find the angle and I gave you one point for the final answer. Okay, so there you go. That's problem number one. I'll come back with number two in just a second. For number two, this was the easiest problem on the test, although also the most missed problem on the test. First question is, what's the English word that has the same meaning as the physics word, force of gravity? The answer is weight. Your weight is your force of gravity. Notice it's a force, not 9.8. 9.8 is an acceleration. Weight is a force. And the equation for the force of gravity is the force of gravity is mg. Notice it's a vector equation because forces are always vectors. And the direction of the force of gravity is the same as the acceleration of gravity straight down. So uh, there you go. It's, uh, I gave you three points for knowing the word weight, three points for knowing the equation, and one point for recognizing that it's a vector. Anyway, that's number two. Number three is coming up. Number three is a classic projectile motion problem. Uh, my brother is named Andy and he's always throwing rotten fruit at me in the garden. Zucchinis particularly, they, they, they get, if you leave them on the vine too long, those things just keep on growing. And they're no longer edible, but they don't stop growing. They just keep getting bigger and bigger and stinkier and stinkier. And then you pick it up and you throw it and that explodes real nice when it hits the ground. So anyway, <laughs> not that I would ever throw any rotten fruit at him, but anyway. Here's Andy throwing the rotten zucchini across the garden. And uh, it, notice it takes this nice parabolic shape. It's, it's not a triangle. Uh, it's not a straight line. It's a parabola. It's a parabolic shape. And it, it, it starts at a certain height and it starts at a certain angle. And the problem tells us, notice it starts, it's not straight up, it's kind of crooked up. But to start with, it's going that way. And so let me draw that over here to the side. There's this initial velocity here. And I think the problem tells you it's 12.3 it's, uh, meters per second. Now, that's a crooked vector. And every single time you see a crooked vector, you have to break it down into its x and y parts. So this is initial velocity x. This is initial velocity y. <clears throat> and the problem gives you an angle. I think it said 62.3. OK. And uh, so right off the bat, you can find those two components. And so those two components, this is going to, because this is the hypotenuse and this is the adjacent, this side's going to be cosine. Remember, so ka toa? I would write that right at the top. So ka toa. Okay? Adjacent and hypotenuse. Adjacent and hypotenuse. That's ka. That's cosine. Okay? So, um, Cosine of theta is adjacent, which is V naught X, over the hypotenuse, which is 12.3. So we're going to multiply the 12.3 up there. So V naught X is going to be 12.3 times the cosine of 62.3, which when you punch that out um, <coughs> is 5.71. By the same token, you can do this one. This is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. This is going to be a sine function. So V naught Y is going to be 12.3 times the sine of 62.3. And this answer is going to be 10.89. OK, so that's the first part of this. But now to solve the problem, uh, we need to break this up into this x and y motion. So we spent a lot of time doing this in this chapter. Uh, we did it in the lab. This is why you do the labs, actually. 
Um, just as a side note, the reason I have the labs do before the test, you know, that's the DO part, I have you do the labs before the test is because the labs help you learn the material. Okay, so the idea is you order those, those cannon things and you shoot those little marble things and the little, I don't know what they are, those little cannonball things. Anyway, you, you do that when it says so on the schedule because that's when you're learning this stuff on the homework and it, the labs reinforce the homework and the homework reinforces the labs. It helps you learn the material. The labs are not there to just give you extra work. If you treat them like extra work, you save them all for the end, it'll be just that. It'll be just a big pile of extra work and you just pull your hair out and get angry about it. But if you do it when it says to do it, that's DO, to do it along the way on the schedule, the schedule's laid out on the website, it'll help you learn the material. It'll give you the practice that you need to learn this material. That's why they're there. It's not just extra work, it's there to help you. But anyway, <clears throat> when you're doing these, solving these projectile motion problems, step one is always split it into X motion and Y motion because they're independent from each other. And in the X direction, you can only use one equation. The velocity in the X direction is equal to the distance along the X divided by time. <clears throat> and in the Y direction, you only have one equation. Delta Y is equal to V naught Y times T plus one half AY times t squared. This is equation number one, this is equation number three. Notice I changed it for the y direction. You can do that. It's not, now, <clears throat> these equations only work in one dimension at a time, either x or y. Don't try to mix and match, put some of x and some of y and some combination in there. Just, it doesn't work. It's, you either do it all y or all x or just don't do it. Okay, so let's start over here first. The velocity in the x direction, well that's this. And you say, but wait, that's the initial velocity. See that? V naught x, that means initial. Then time is zero, yeah. Well, you're right, that is what that means. But in the x direction, there's no acceleration. So what the speed is at the beginning is what it is along the way. So the speed at the beginning is the speed along the way. And so that's the 5.71. And <clears throat> The question is, how far is that? Well, let me draw it up here on the, on the picture. That delta x is from where the zucchini started to where the zucchini ended, in the x direction. That's what the question's asking for. How far is this? And <clears throat> this would be like if you dropped a plumb bob from the, from the rotten zucchini when he, before, right before Andy threw it, that, that, that position. Anyway, uh, so the question is, what's delta x? So how are we going to do that? We're going to multiply the t up here. So delta x is going to be vx times t, which is going to be that 5.71 times t. And if only we had t, we could answer the question. Well, we don't have t, but we can get it over here in the y. Okay, so let me write this a little bit smaller here, times t. Okay, so now let's solve this one. Now, over here, you know everything except t. You know initial velocity in the y direction. It's right there, you already figured it out. You know acceleration in the y direction. We're on planet Earth. So it's negative 9.81. And you know delta y. Well, how do you know delta y? Well, the problem tells you that the zucchini starts here and ends on the ground. Well, that delta y, this distance from here to here, that's your delta y. And notice which way it's going. It starts high, ends low. Starts high, ends in the ground. Delta y is this way, going down. So the problem tells you that, <clears throat> so let me write, write those pieces out. So this delta y here is going to be negative 2.11. Initial velocity in the y direction is positive 10.89. And acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.81. So now you know everything in here except for t, and it leaves you with a beautiful quadratic equation, which everybody just loves. 
I love quadratic equations. And uh, that was sarcasm, in case you were wondering. Uh, so let's, let's write out how to find this quadratic equation. Okay, so let me write this out. We're going to have negative 2.11 <coughs> is equal to 10.89 minus 9.81 over 2 times t squared. And I dropped my t over here. Okay, notice I changed the plus to a minus because it's negative 9.81. And I put my half and my ay in one piece so the ay is upstairs and the half is downstairs. Okay, and, and now remember the equation. It says <coughs> if you have something that looks like this, some number times the thing you're looking for squared plus some other number times the thing you're looking for not squared plus some number and all equals c. If that's the case, then the thing you're looking for is equal to negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac, all of which is over 2a. <clears throat> so if only we could make this look like that, we could just plug it in and get our answer. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, this is your a piece. So here's what we've got. We've got uh, negative 4.905. That's 9.81 over 2 times t squared. <clears throat> we've got plus 10.89t. And now we've got to subtract this to the other side, actually add it to the other side. So we're going to have plus 2.11. All this equals 0. And now the thing we're looking for is that t. So t is equal to negative 10.89 plus or minus square root b squared, 10.89 squared minus 4 times a, which is negative 4.905 times c, which is 2.11. All that is under the square root. And then we divide by, and this thing's not under the square root, 2 times a, which is negative 4.905. <clears throat> when you're doing this on your calculator, I'd do this whole square root thing first, and then I'd do this, and I'd, well, this, you don't have to do much with that one. And then I'd do this one. And you've got to do it twice, once for the plus and once for the minus. Anyway, when you punch it all out, you get either negative 0.17, so nine, yeah, 179 seconds or 2.40 seconds. <clears throat> well, since time doesn't go backwards, that's not it. So the time that this thing spends in the air is 2.4 seconds. So now we can go back over here to our original x direction, plug that in right there. So delta x is equal to 5.71 times 2.40, and when you punch that out, you get 13.72 seconds. And so notice there was only two questions for this. Question number one was, how far from Andy's feet did the zucchini travel? That's the delta x. And two, how much time did the zucchini spend in the air? So now we have it all answered. So let me show you where I put the points. I gave you three points for each of these. Three points if you knew that you had to break down that initial velocity vector. You always have to do that, by the way. I gave you two points if you knew that you had to split up x and y. <coughs> I gave you three points if you knew this equation, and three points if you knew this equation. I gave you one point if you knew that that was negative. Boy, that's a pesky negative sign. It's easy to get dropped. And then I gave you one point for this answer and one point for this answer. So notice there's only two points for answers on this. There, everything else uh, um, was in the work along the way. This was a 17 point problem, 15 points for, for work along the way. And uh, there you go. There's number three. Number four is coming up. Number four is all about 
uh, going to the train yard for a workout. Now, this is not a very realistic uh, thing. The trains are, are way too heavy for us to do any workout with them. Although, uh, I mean, it can be done. You gotta, it's not just straight up pushing on them. You gotta do some tools. But anyway, that's another issue. Uh, so <clears throat> it gives you the, the mass of the coal car. It's empty. There's not even any coal in it. And, and then you said, you, the problem says you're just going out there and pushing these around. So there's you pushing on the coal car and um, <clears throat> gives you the mass of the coal car and tells you how much time it takes you to push it just a short distance and, uh, and gives you the coefficient of friction. So um, step one, let's identify the forces. So the forces on this coal car are, it's, it's massive. So that means the force of gravity is pulling it straight down. Well, why doesn't it go down? Well, because the ground's in the way. Well, the ground provides a normal force. So that normal force is pushing it back up. Well, then there's you pushing it, pushing on it. So you're pushing in it, the force of you pushing on it. But then there's friction too. So that's on the wheels. And so there's friction going backwards, opposing you, okay? And so those are the only forces on this. And, and at this point, we now have to start figuring this out. So uh, let's do some of the forces in both directions. So if we do some of the forces in the y direction and add these up to 0. Well, let me write, let me write it out. Some of the forces always equals ma. And we're talking about in the y direction. Now, pause for a second. Which way is the y direction? Well, that's straight up or straight down. Now, how fast is that car go? Car, how much fat, how, let me try this again. How fast does that car accelerate up or accelerate down? Well, it doesn't. At best, it's going to move forward a little ways, but it's not going to go up. It's not going to go down. So the acceleration of this car in the y direction is zero. So now if we add up the forces, there's a normal force and a gravity. Those are the only two forces in the y direction here. So we're going to add those up. So the normal force minus the force of gravity, and they have to add up to zero. And we have an equation for this. So the normal force minus mg equals zero. And so now we can just add that over here, and the normal force tells us mg. So let me try it again. So Newton's second law in the y direction tells us the normal force for the situation. And for this particular situation, it's very easy. It's just mg. And if you punch that out, you're going to get uh, 269,775 newtons. This is a heavy coal car. It's empty. By the way, this is the standard size of those coal, car coal cars. Those things are huge. <clears throat> well, because Newton's second law is a vector equation, you have to do it in the x and the y. Here's the y. Let's do it in the x direction. So now we're going to do some of the forces in the x direction. These have to equal mass times acceleration in the x direction. Now it is going to accelerate because you're, you're beefy enough that when you push on that thing, it actually moves. It's pretty impressive, by the way. Anyway, so uh, well, what forces are there in the x direction? Well, there's only two. There's the force of you pushing on it and the force of friction opposing you. So we've got the force of you, and it's going to the right, so it's positive, and the force of friction, and that's negative. That's why I did subtraction. And, and these have to equal mass of the coal car times its acceleration. Well, the question is, how, far, how hard did you push on it? Well, we have an equation for this, so we're gonna, we're, eventually we're going to solve for this force of u. We're going to subtract off the equation here. That's normal force times mu. Good thing we know the normal force now. And that equals ma. So we could answer this question if only we knew the acceleration. Well, it doesn't quite tell us the acceleration, but it does tell us a distance that it moves. It tells us that it starts from rest and that it takes 10 whole minutes to get it that, to go that distance. It's not very far. So to figure out acceleration, you need um, equation number three. Delta x is equal to v naught times t plus 1 half a oops, times t squared. Now notice this is the same equation I used on the last problem, but the last time it was in the in the y direction. This time it's in the x direction because that's where the car is moving. So you, you can use it in either or, but not both. So we're using it in the x direction now. Well, the problem tells us that 
the car starts from rest, so the initial velocity is zero. And we're trying to find that acceleration. We have the distance, we have the time. Let's just solve it. So we're going to multiply both sides by 2 and divide both sides by t squared. So we're going to get a is equal to 2 times delta x over t squared. And so 2 times delta x is 1.12. And the time is 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. And you better square that because that's t squared. That, you see that? 10 minutes converted to 60 to 60 minute, I'll try again, 60 seconds in each minute. And there's 10 minutes, that's 600 seconds. Whew. Okay, so it's a big denominator there. So the acceleration of this coal car is 6.22 times 10 to the negative 6 meters per second squared. Extremely slow. Extremely slow. There's snails that go faster than that. Anyway, <clears throat> that's, that's the acceleration that you pushed this train car with. Uh, that, that was the, the acceleration that resulted from you pushing on this train car. So we're going to plug that in over here and now we can solve this for the force of U. So we're just going to add this piece to the other side because it's subtracted now so we're going to add it over there. So this is going to be the force of U is equal to MA plus the normal force times mu. So when we plug all this in we're going to have uh, Twenty-seven hundred five. I mean, twenty-seven thousand five hundred kilograms times the acceleration. Point, uh, six point two two times ten to the negative six <coughs> plus normal force, which is uh, over here. 269,775 times mu that was given in the problem as 0 0.011. Let's not get our pictures mixed up here. And when you work all this out, uh, you're going to get a very, you, you get this answer, uh, 2,967.7 newtons. Okay? And, uh, that's a lot of force, just in case you're looking this up. That's about 667 pounds, which strong humans can do. Uh, usually in a deadlift or a squat or something like that, pushing forwards, it's a little bit harder. But uh, there you go. In any case, uh, this is not a normal workout. Okay, that's problem number four. Number five is coming up. Number five, this is the hardest problem on the test. Definitely the hardest problem on the test. Here we go. You're flying an airplane, or a pilot is. Needs to land at Tuskegee. The FAA identifier for Tuskegee is 06 Alpha. You're straight south of Tuskegee, and you're trying to go that way, except that there's the wind. The wind is blowing you kind of crooked. It, it's a tailwind part way that'll help you get there quicker, but it's also a crosswind, so you gotta point the nose. If you just point the nose straight north, you won't get to Tuskegee, you'll end up off course. <clears throat> So you have to point your nose a little bit crooked that way so that you'll go straight north. And the question is how much do you have to point, how far over do you need to point your nose? So I'm going to draw a picture. Your airplane can't go straight north. Your airplane's got to go this way. There's your tail. Okay, so the airplane's going to have to point a little bit crooked and the question is how crooked are you going to have to point it? Well. <clears throat> The problem gives you lots of information, so let me write it all out. Um, the speed of the plane from the air's perspective, it's called the airspeed, is given as 43.7 meters per second. And then it tells you the speed of the wind. Now, what is that? The speed of the wind. That's the speed of the air from the Earth's perspective, okay? So this is the speed 
of the air from the Earth's perspective is 19.3 meters per second at 32.8 degrees uh, north of west. Okay, so notice, here's my crooked vector. The, the wind is blowing that way. West is air, it's 32 degrees north of west. So let me draw that into components. Notice that's a crooked vector right off the bat. We've done this before. This is, so this is velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective. This is velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the x direction. Velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the y direction. And this angle here, that's your 32.8. So when you apply the SOHCAHTOA to this, <coughs> this will be uh, velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the x direction is equal to velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective times cosine of 32.8. And that answer is um, 16.22 meters per second. And then the y direction, velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the y direction, that's going to be the sine function. This is opposite. There's hypotenuse. There's going to be velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective. That's the 19.3 times the sine of 32.8. When you punch this out, this will give you, um, where do I have that written? Oh yeah, there it is. 10.46 meters per second. Okay, so Every time you see a crooked vector, break it down. Guaranteed. Okay? <clears throat> now, now notice, see this number here? It didn't tell you which way it's going, but your plane's going to have to be crooked. So that's, that's a crooked vector too. You just don't know the parts yet. But you know it's crooked because look at your picture. And I think everybody on the test said, oh, the, plane, the pilot's going to have to point that nose a little bit northeast to counteract that southwest wind to counteract that wind coming over from over there. Anyway, intuitively you understand this, making the math happen is a little bit tricky. <clears throat> but this is a crooked vector, you just don't know how crooked it is yet. That's what you're trying to figure out. So it's a crooked vector, and, and I'll draw it here. It's this, this is uh, the velocity of the plane from the air's perspective, and, and this is 43.7, and it's crooked that way, but you don't know the components yet. If only you knew those components, you could answer this whole question. And really, that's, uh, that's, that's a big piece of what we're trying to find here, okay? So let me write that out. Velocity plane air x, velocity plane uh, from the air's perspective in the y direction. So there's the x and there's the y. And we don't know those components because the problem didn't tell it to us. Okay? But we do know this is a relative velocity problem because you've got uh, two things that are moving, the plane and the air, and one thing that's not moving, that's the earth, or you can call it the ground if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. But the equation that we need is velocity AB is equal to velocity a from the Earth's perspective minus velocity B from the Earth's perspective. And, and A and B are your two moving things. And, and the hardest part about all this is just trying to figure out what are my two moving things and what order do I write them in? And the answer is right here. It's the velocity of the plane from the air's perspective. So now I'm going to rewrite this. Velocity of the plane from the air's perspective is equal to velocity of the plane from the Earth's perspective minus the velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective. Okay, and now this is a vector. So I'm going to write this, split this up into x and y components. x, y. Do this all the problems. Split it up, x and y. Split it up, x and y. And I'm going to write this equation out vertically so that we're going to have velocity, plane, from the Earth's perspective in the x direction minus velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the x direction. And that's going to give us velocity of the plane from the air's perspective in the x direction. This, see that? The answer here is that side. We don't know it yet. We've got to try to figure it out. Now we're going to write the same thing. We're going to plug in the numbers here in just a second. Okay? Let me write it out over here. Velocity, plane, Earth, y minus velocity, air, Earth, y 
when we do that subtraction, it's going to give us velocity plane air y. Notice this is that. This, we don't know that. We're trying to figure it out. We're going to plug in all these numbers. We're going to plug in what we know. Now, <clears throat> the, the, now that we have this, we have this structure. We just have to fill in what we can know. There are six blanks here. Blank, 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 blank. Fill in two here and two there. Doesn't matter which two, any two you can fill in, and you can find the third in both. So that's what we're trying to do here. So let's start filling these in. Now notice, this is talking about the plane from the Earth's perspective, x, and plane from the Earth's perspective, y. Now remember, that plane started south, trying to go straight north to Tuskegee. Straight north. Well, how are you going to get there? It, you've got to go straight north from the Earth's perspective. Well, that's this number. So there's going to be a number here. We don't know what it is, but I can tell you this number is zero. Why? Well, because if the plane had an x velocity, it wouldn't go straight north. It would go a little bit east or a little bit west. And so this number, looking at the problem, we can figure out that number is zero. And, and, and look at this. We have these two pieces here. We can plug those in. Look. Velocity of the air from the Earth's perspective in the x direction, there it is right there. It's this number. Notice it's going to the left. That's negative. So the problem says subtract. So I'm going to write minus negative 16.22. And hey, I can do that math. I can do that one in my head. That's easy. That's just minus a negative. That's plus. So I'm going to get 16.22. Hey, look at that. I know now, I now know part of this. Oh. Okay, well, I also know this one over here because I did that one too, and that one's going up, so that's positive, so it's going to be something, we don't know, minus positive 10.46. Now, look at this. We just figured out this side of the triangle right there. We know this is 16.22. Well, I know that side already. The problem told me. Well, if you know this side and this side, can you get that side? Yeah, that's a right triangle. Well, that's just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So I can find this one. I'll let you do that one. That's just basic algebra. Y'all can do that. You can get that side. That side is going to be 40.58. And you're, let me write out, I'll write out what you need to do. 43.7 squared minus 16.22 squared. Okay, and that's how you're going to get this answer. Okay, but now that I know that, that's the velocity of the plane from the air's perspective in the y direction. And notice, it's going up. Okay, so how did I know it was going up? Well, because remember over here, we said, well, that plane's going to have to point its nose kind of yada way because the wind's blowing this way. And so in order to pull that off, this has to go that way. And so I've got a part going this way and a part going this way. And so I now know this piece of the triangle. 40.58. That's not a triangle. This piece of the, I mean, it is the piece of that triangle, but now I know these pieces. And now, because I know two, I can find the third. Well, now, that's, that's, just, that's just good old-fashioned algebra. That's just addition kind of algebra. So the answer here is going to be 51.03. That's the speed of the plane in the y direction. That's how fast the plane travels straight north to Tuskegee. <clears throat> what city would be straight south of Tuskegee? I don't know. Dothan. I don't know. Something like that. Some, some town. There's not much town. Maybe Troy. Troy might be straight south of there. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, what are the questions? They asked two questions. Now that we've done all this, we can answer any question this asks. Let's see what it asks. Okay, and by the way, this method that we did here is the method you're going to do for every um, relative velocity problem. Every time, this is the way you're going to do it. So, split it up in x and y, write out your equation, the x, the x equation, the y equation, figure out what your equation needs to be. 
make triangles out of everything you can, okay? Um, and then the question is, two questions, uh, what will be the ground speed? And what angle does the pilot need to point the nose? Okay, well, let's do ground speed first. Okay, well in the X direction, there's nothing. So there's only Y direction right there, that's your ground speed. So this is ground speed. So if you wanted to run to keep up with that airplane, that's how fast you'd have to run. As you're running on the ground, you'd have to be running real good. That running along the ground to keep up with that airplane, that's the speed you'd have to go. Straight Y, straight in the Y direction. Now the next question is what angle? Where does the pilot have to point his nose? Well, that's this angle here. That's the angle that the pilot has to point his nose. So uh, to find that angle, we'll use tangent. We, we have all three sides of the triangle, so it doesn't matter. You could use you could use uh, cosine here, you could use sine there, or you can use tangent here. I'll use tangent, I don't know why, it makes me happy. So we're gonna do tangent of theta is opposite, which is 40.58 over adjacent, which is 16.22. So when we take arc tangent of both sides, we get an angle of um, 68.21. Okay, that's that angle. So now, we better be careful here because unless you label it clearly on your paper, I don't know what angle you're talking about, that's 68.21 degrees north of east. Okay, there's east, there's north, 68.2 degrees north of east is right there, okay? so. There you go. Oh, where did I put the points? Let me show you. I gave you three points. Well, let me start over here. I gave you three points for knowing the general equation. If you said, this is the relative velocity equation, I don't know anything about it, but I know it's relative velocity, I know the equation for that, I gave you three points for that. If you then could turn that generalized equation into this specific situation, I gave you three more points. If you split it up into X and Y, I gave you two points. If you knew that you had to split up that crooked vector there, two points for each of the legs. I gave you three points for this zero, because that was a kind of a critical piece. I gave you two points for this. That, that means, all that means is you knew how to plug that in. <coughs> I gave you two points for this. That's another one you just had to plug in. Then I gave you two points for recognizing that this answer up here is the ground speed. And I gave you one point for getting it right. Then I gave you uh, two, uh, three points for knowing that you had to use Pythagorean theorem to find that piece. And then I gave you one point for, recognize, for knowing the trig function you needed to use, and one point for the answer. Okay, there you go. There's number five. Number six is coming up. We're getting close to the end here. Five out of seven. Number six, you had, uh, you decided to build a zip line in your backyard and there's a tree, and there's a tree, and there's, but you didn't do a very good job. I don't know, you maybe you didn't oil the bearings in your little trolley, or I don't know what you did wrong, but somehow the thing doesn't work. And now, the poor kid, you know, going down the zip line and got stuck right there. And so the question is, what is this tension in these two lines? So you've got um, a tension going this way, and a tension going this way, and a tension is just a force in, in this case it's a cable, but whatever, whether it be a string or a rope or a spring or whatever, tension is the force that pulls, okay? And so I call this T1 and I call this T2, and those are your two tensions, and, and looky there, there's a crooked vector, and I know what to do with crooked vectors every time, every single time you see a crooked vector, 
you break it down, x and y. So there's t1x and t1y. Now there's, there's more forces on this kid. There's just one more, actually. And that's his own weight. Acts at his belly button. Force of gravity is the kid's mass times gravity. And the problem tells you the kid has a mass of 35 kilograms. And so now, there you go. Those are the three forces on your object. Your object is the kid. And, uh, and one of them is crooked. You've got to break it down. And now you can just apply Newton's second law. So let's do so. Of course, Newton's second law is a vector equation. So you've got to break it down into its x and y components. So we'll do x first. Some of the forces in the x direction has to equal mass times acceleration in the x direction. Well, how fast is that kid accelerating? Well, he's not. We already figured out the thing broke, and he's stuck right there in the middle. So the acceleration of this kid is zero. So we're going to add up all the forces in the x direction. I only see two. There's a, a positive t2 and a negative t1x. And they have to add up to zero. And we have an equation for t1x because that's the adjacent of that triangle. See that? That side's touching the angle. The side that touches the angle is the adjacent one. So this is the adjacent. That's the hypotenuse. So um, we can just say t2 minus t1 times the cosine of theta is equal to zero. OK, well, one equation, two unknowns. Guess I better keep going. We'll try the other equation. Some of the forces in the y direction have to add up to the mass times acceleration in the y direction. But we already determined this kid is stuck in the middle. He's not moving, so the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So now we're going to add up all our forces in the y direction. I only see two. T1y, that's up, so it's positive, And force of gravity is down, so that's negative, And they have to add up to zero. Well, we have an equation for both of those. This is the opposite side of that triangle, so that's going to be a sine function. T1 times the sine of theta is equal to, I'm sorry, minus mg equals zero. There you go. Well, hey, look. I know everything in this equation but t1. I can do that. I'll just add the mg and divide by the sine theta. So t1 is equal to mg over sine theta. That's going to be 35 times 9.81 divided by the sine of 35. I guess it was kind of unfortunate that the kid's mass and that angle were the same number, but it's just the way it worked out. And so this t1 is 598.2 newtons. Okay. Well, now that I know that, I can plug that number in up here, and I can solve for t2. I just add this whole piece over there. So t2 is equal to t1 times the cosine of theta. And so when I punch this out here, this is going to be 598.2 times the cosine of theta. And we know that angle is 35. And so when we punch this out, that's going to be 490.36 newtons. That's T2. OK? Now, a couple of you on this, uh, your intuition was kicking into overdrive there. And, and you were just kind of drawing triangles out of this randomly. But you, you, didn't, you didn't flesh out Newton's second law. The beauty of using Newton's second law to do this is that your gut is wrong. Your intuition is wrong a good 50% of the time. And a couple of you had your intuition working right here, and you got off with that. But it doesn't always work that easy. Newton's second law, that's right, every single time. And it's not too hard to add it all up. Just, just add up your forces, set them equal to 0. It's not too bad. Draw a careful picture. You'll be right every single time. Every single time. And that's kind of nice. I, I like getting hundreds on tests. That's a good way to go. Anyway, one more problem coming up. Oh, wait. Points. Where did I put the points on this? I'm sorry. Here we go. Points. Uh, <clears throat> if you knew that you needed to split it up into x and y, I gave you three points. Then, over here, I gave you three points. Three points and one point. And over here, I gave you three points, three points, and one point. That's three points for knowing that equation, three points for that equation, and one point for knowing that's zero. Same thing over here. And then, and then 
I gave you one point for each of the answers. Okay, there you go. That's where I put the points. Now there's really one more question left. Number seven, coming up. Number seven is a classic problem. You've got two masses, one's hanging there, and, and this massless, frictionless pulley in the middle. As soon as you find one of those, you let me know, because I want some. They don't really exist. Anyway, uh, we'll learn about pulleys that actually have mass and actually have friction in a few chapters. But for now, we're just pretending they, 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 they redirect the tension, but don't affect the tension at all. In reality, they do affect the tension, but we're pretending they don't, <coughs> other than uh, redirecting it. So uh, this is a, a Newton's second law problem. And, and really, um, Newton's second law is, is huge. This is the bulk of this class, really, Newton's second law. So in order to apply Newton's second law, you need to know where the forces are. So we're, we're going to look at this one first. And we're going to identify the forces on it. Well, I've only got two. Its own weight is pulling it down. Remember the weight, force of gravity. And then tension. Pulling it up. So on the on the uh, um, the five kilogram mass, okay. We're gonna do Newton's second law. Some of the forces equals m a. And you're gonna say, but well, wait a second. I thought that's a vector equation. You're right. It is. Well then, why aren't you breaking it up into x and y? Well, because there's nothing in the x. Look at it. It's all y. So I won't even bother with the x because there's nothing there. So I'll just write some of the forces in the y direction equal mass times acceleration in the y direction. Okay, so uh, we're going to have tension. This says add them up, so that's what we're going to do. Minus force of gravity. There's only, there's only two. This plus a negative of that equals ma. Now don't say zero here, because that thing's going to go down. And don't say 9.8 because it's not going to go that fast. There's a rope slowing it down. We don't know that A. We've got to find it. In fact, we don't know this A, and we don't know this T. Two unknowns, one equation. Let me write it out. We have an equation for this. Tension minus mg equals ma. And you know what? I'm going to call this the right mass as opposed to the left. So this is mass right, and this is mass right, okay? So we had all the forces on the right mass. Now let's do the left mass, okay? So uh, I'll use a little bit different color here. Well, what are the forces on this one? Well, there's more forces on this one. We've got gravity pulling it straight down. We have normal force perpendicular to the surface. We've got friction pulling it this way. And we've got tension pulling it this way. Four forces. Now, we have to be careful. We're going to need a coordinate system here. So let me put up a coordinate system. OK, so we've got X and Y, forces pulling us. <coughs> so so if, if we use X and Y that way, and remember, if you go back in chapter four and see how I taught you how to do it, every time you have an inclined plane, you're going to do it this way. So if that's the case, then I only have one crooked vector. So my one crooked vector is this one. And so I'm going to break it down, X and Y. So this side here is force of gravity x, and this side here is force of gravity y, and there's your angle up there. Okay? Now, let's do some of the forces on the left mass. And, and notice, we do have two dimensions here, so we're going to have to deal with both. So we're going to do some of the forces x and some of the forces y on the left mass. Okay? So some of the forces x equal mass times acceleration in the x direction. On this is on left mass. Okay, 
So we're going to do x first. So we've got friction going to the left, so that's negative. We're going to have negative force of friction. This says add them up, so we're going to add them all up. This first one's going negative right here, force of friction. Tension's going to the right. We're going to make that one positive, so we're going to do plus tension. <coughs> and force of gravity in the y direction, I didn't put that arrow on there, that's important. That arrow right here is going down. So, uh, wait a second, we want the x, so we want this one, it's going that way, and that's negative. Okay, so we're going to do um, minus force of gravity x, and this equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. Now, <clears throat> as I was doing that, I just noticed that I made a mistake. I'll show you the mistake in a second, but let me finish this thought over here. We've got three forces in the x direction. One, two, three. Three forces in the x direction, so that's these three. One, two, and three. Only one of them's going up. But notice which way this mass is going to go. You can look at the picture and see this one's heavier. That whole system's going to go this way. So this acceleration that way is the same as this acceleration that way. And this is the same rope here, so this T and this T are the same thing. Okay? So we do have acceleration here, and I'm just going to call this A. I'm not going to call it AX, even though it is going in the X direction, but I'm going to call it A so that it's the same letter as what I have over here. And which brings up the mistake that I made just a minute ago. Notice this one's going to accelerate up. This one's going to accelerate down. What does that mean? That means this acceleration right here is negative. So I'm going to, I'm going to put it right here, negative A, and I'm going to put it out front here. That little negative sign, it's a pesky one. It'll get you, okay? So don't forget about that negative, okay? So let's fill in these equations as best we can here. The force of friction is going to be normal force times mu. Tension, that's one of the things we don't know we're trying to find. And force of gravity, that's this side of the triangle, that's the opposite side, so it's going to be mg sine theta equals ma. Which m? The right mass. Okay? Now, that's some of the forces in the x direction. So notice, you know, we had two unknowns here, t and a. We only need two equations, two unknowns. So here's our second equation, and there's our A, and there's our T. Hey, hey we should be done, right? Except we don't know N. Oh, we have three unknowns now. We don't know N. Well, how are we going to find this one? Well, we're going to need a third equation. Guess where we're going to get it? Newton's second law in the Y direction. And if you remember, Newton's second law in the Y direction always gives you the normal force if you're talking about this sort of scenario. So. Uh, some of the forces in the y direction equal mass times acceleration in the y direction. And we look at this and we only have two forces. Normal force and force of gravity y. So we're going to have positive normal force minus force of gravity y, that's these two, equal zero. How do I know it's zero? Well this mass, once it moves, it's only going to move that way. That's straight x. It's not going to go this way in the y direction. It's not going to launch off of here like a rocket, nor is it going to go through there like a, I don't know, a drill or something like that. It's not going to go through the inclined plane. So this, has, this, this acceleration in the y direction is going to be zero. So we have an equation for this, normal force minus fgy. That's the adjacent side of that triangle, so that's going to be a cosine function, mg cosine theta. This has to add up to zero. And so we're just going to add this piece to the right side, so that it's going to tell us the normal force. Normal force is mg cos theta. And uh, don't forget, this is the right mass that we're talking about, not the left mass. Nope, nope, sorry. Left mass, not the right mass. There we go. Did I fix that over here? Oh, I did it wrong over there, too. This is the left mass, not the right mass. Got to keep them straight. Okay. There we go. Now there's our three equations and three unknowns. So what are you going to do with this? Well, you're going to take this one <coughs> and you're going to plug it in right there. And then I would solve 
this one for t. So I'll just add this mg over there. So t is equal to um, positive right mass times gravity minus right mass times acceleration. And now I'm going to take this and plug it in right there. And then you'll have one equation. And I'll write that out here. Now that you have that one equation, you're going to have mass left times gravity times cosine theta. That's this thing times mu plus t, which is that thing over there, mass right times gravity minus mass right times a minus this thing here minus mass left times gravity times the sine of theta equals mass left times acceleration. So you have one equation and one unknown, a. Shows up twice, so we'll combine like terms. I'll add this one over there. So our left side is going to be negative mass left times gravity, cos theta times mu, <coughs> plus mass right times gravity. This one's going to be over there. Minus mass left times gravity times the sine of theta equals mass right oops, times a plus mass left times a. And we can combine like terms over here. So this is going to be mass right plus mass left times a. I can simplify this all right here. So OK. And now all these are numbers that you know. Plug it all in. You know those two numbers. Divide them over. You get done. And you can get your two answers. I'll write them out here. a is equal to. 1.45 meters per second, and T is equal to 41.8 newtons. OK? So now you might be asking, well, where'd you put the points on this? Well, let me show you. Oops, I'm all tangled up here. OK, where did I put the points? <coughs> uh, I gave you three points. For each of these three pieces, see there's a uh, tension, mass right times gravity, mass right times acceleration. And because this negative sign is so very pesky, I gave you one point for knowing they had to put a negative sign there. Then I gave you three points for each of these pieces over here, three, 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 and three. And the same thing here, three. Three, but this one I only gave you 1.4 because it's just a zero. And I gave you one point for each answer. And there you go. That's number seven. Okay, I hope that helps you as you prepare for, um, well, let me just say this again. <clears throat> the final exam is cumulative for this class. So you do need to know this stuff because you'll need it for the final exam. So I hope this helps you as you prepare for the final exam. I hope, you, I hope it helps you now as you try to figure out what you just did. And uh, I hope it helps you understand how I give tests and how I grade tests, because test two is coming up next week. And so uh, today is Wednesday. The test two is going to be next Friday. So um, I hope this helps you get ready for test two and for the final exam. OK, so with that said, uh, we have a study session tomorrow at 2.30, so I hope to see you there. Bring some questions.